Susan Lacey is the creator, executive producer of American Masters and has a new documentary film called Very Ralph on HBO. Uh, I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby. And Susan, you know, when you look at the previous documentaries, you made documentaries about Jane Fonda and Steven Spielberg. Uh, Ralph Lauren is in very many ways in that vein, but yet totally different. Um, what was different about this subject as opposed to the, the previous films you've made? Well, for one, um, I didn't have a, the same kind of body of, I mean, there was a body of work, but I didn't have the same kind of body of work, like a whole bunch of films and a whole bunch of archive footage and, you know, dramatic stories, you know, with ups and downs and, you know, activism. And it was a different kind of story. And it was harder, actually. It was a much harder film to, to make for me because, um, not really a fashion person and uh i was you know hbo wanted me to make this film and i was a little bit reluctant at first because i'm not a particularly fashion person and i wasn't sure if i'd be really good at doing at making this film so i spent a lot of time examining how do i tell this story about someone who is in the fashion world who says i'm not a fashion designer how do you make a film about someone who says I don't do it, the, you know, he doesn't do all the things that fashion designers do. You can't make a beautiful Dior type film where somebody's draping and, you know, and, and creating in front of your very eyes. This is a man who understood something about America and, and, it, and it spoke to him as a young man. And he brought the love of the things that he loved from the movies primarily and said, I want to have that. And I want to have that. And I can't buy that. So I think I'll make it. I mean, it's a really different kind of story. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be interesting and fun for me to do. But I wasn't sure at the beginning. You know, it wasn't like I had a solid, you know, you know what I'm saying. It wasn't yeah. a solid understanding of what exactly is this story. Um, but I, I hope I found it. Um, people seem to have responded to it. Well, I, you, you mentioned this, uh, that he's not like a lot of fashion designers where, you know, he's actually you know, draping and sewing and, you know, so, and there's certainly a cinematic aspect to that. Did that pr propose a challenge, uh, a, a specific challenge in terms of creating something more cinematic than just having talking heads talking about what he's doing? Well, actually, no, because, uh, you know, his, I could draw on the movies themselves to show the inspiration and his own ads are, you know, kind of beautiful cinematic things and his not just the ads you see on television the print ads he actually conceived them as movies he cast this he cast the story i mean it was only he was the first guy I ever did these multi-page you know 16 page spreads in magazines nobody had ever done that before and he conceived of it very cinematically so it actually was fun to work with that stuff and to kind of show where it came from and and for him, it is always about a story. And, you know, if they said it once, he said it a thousand times. It's never about a shirt. It's about wearing that shirt. It's about the story behind that shirt. It's never about the shirt. Um, so, I mean, it was, uh, I actually found it quite fun to do and to work with. And, you know, of course, those beautiful ads. I mean, they're so much fun. Um, well, and, and I mean, somebody does say in the film, and I kind of agree with it, that you could kind of make fun of this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the seriously aspirational world that is out there that actually nobody actually lives except in the movies. Um, but Ralph believed it, hook, line, and sinker. And I think that was part of the appeal. And I think it's why he was so successful. Everybody wants to kind of have a little piece of that, whatever that is, of this American dream, this beautiful, idealized world. Well, and one of the things that, that I found so fascinating was, you know, a lot of times, particularly, I think there's the stereotype in the world of fashion that, that there's this inherent kind of rivalry between different designers and different, um, and different people. And yet you had so many other designers singing Ralph, Ralph Lauren's praises. Um, was that was that something that would surprised you in terms of going to them and saying, hey, would you like to talk about Ralph Lauren? Uh, no, it didn't. Because, I mean, when he came up um, the same time that Donna Karen and Calvin Klein 
came up. It was really the first time that American designers began to have an identity and they were all sort of the same age, all coming up together. They knew each other, they were friends. And I'm sure there's always a little bit of rivalry. I mean, I just think that they are kind of in awe a little bit that he <laughs> had this bigger vision than they did. I mean, Calvin Klein says that we were busy working our collections. He was busy building a brand and he understood the importance of that brand and how to do that. And Donna Karen says, how did he get the first floor in Bloomingdale's? You know, because nobody had ever done that before. A store within a store within a store. He was the first one to do that. So I think that there was a lot of respect for his vision, his broader vision of how to build a business and build a brand. That's not to say that they, that, you know, I'm sure that they all think that they all, all that they all made better clothes, you know, I mean, but that, that didn't enter the picture. They were all very different. And that would have, that had a lot to do with why those three were able to distinguish themselves. You know, Donna says I was black and white and, you know, drapes and working women and Calvin was minimalist and silks and Ralph was, you know, the horsey set and the English <laughs> look, you know? So they, were, they weren't really competing in that way. What they were doing was building a reputation for American design around the world. And that bonded them, I think, in some way. I, I, you know, the interesting thing I think about designers is that, you know, you get, you have sort of this almost sort of preconceived notion, I think a lot of people do, of what designers are, that they're these extravagant, larger than life people. And yet one of the things that I think comes through so beautifully in the film is that, you know, Ralph is pretty a down to earth, um, oh, yeah. you know, a very much a family man. Um, w when you first sat down with him, uh, not knowing that much about him or having that much interaction personally, what surprised you about him? I was, I think we both surprised each other at how real we both were. I mean, I wasn't trying to impress him in any way and he wasn't trying to impress me. And we, we got so personal so quickly, um, you know, and, and sharing some experiences that we both had had with some illness and, um, a lot of people ask, why did you not mention that he had a brain tumor in the film? Um, but it was one of the first things we talked about because I've had cancer too. And it was because it was really kind of a non-story. I mean, <laughs> he, he knew he had, he knew it wasn't malignant. He had an operation. He went back to work, you know? So, in, and when I tried to get him to talk about how did this change you? Did it change you in any way? Did you, you know, have a different attitude about your life? Did, you know... He said, I thought I was going to, but it didn't. <laughs> I just wanted to get back to work. So it was kind of a non-story. <laughs> and there were a lot of other stories to tell. But what I'm trying to, I got to plug my my computer in. Hold on. Sorry. No problem. Um, just saw the low battery. Come on. Uh, was how quickly we um, were comfortable with each other. And and um, I told him, I, I haven't told this story publicly, but I'll tell you. Hmm. Um, one of the first things I said to him after we'd been together about an hour, it wasn't my first meeting with him. The first one was with other people at HBO. And then I said, I need to meet with him alone. We need to, we need to be comfortable with each other before we proceed. He had to be comfortable with me and we hadn't committed to each other yet. Um, so after about an hour, uh, I said, you know, I was really nervous about meeting you. I mean, about spending time with you. And he said, why? And I said, well, I wasn't sure you were going to like me because I'm not thin. And that took him by such surprise. And I, I don't know what made me do it, but in a way I was trying to signal, I'm going to be really straight with you. And I hope that you're going to be really straight with me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like a bonding thing, you know, and he, and it was so endearing the way he responded to that. Um, because, you know, you meet somebody who's in the fashion world and everybody around them is tall and thin and you're not. And you're going to make the film. So I know that may seem odd to you, that, that, but that was a very important moment, actually, between us. That uh, I could say that to him and, and he, he could say, you're way too focused on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't worry about that. But it was, it was a moment of genuine honesty, is my point. And... Uh, and I did it kind of on purpose so that he would be honest with me too. And I think we got as close as 
that's possible with somebody like Ralph, uh, who I like, who grew, who I grew to like, by the way, very much. But it's very hard for somebody who has built their life and their brand around their image, and that's very, very much the case with Ralph Lauren, much more so than almost any other designer that I can, except for Chanel, maybe. Um, to let go, to let that veneer down. And uh, it took a lot of effort on my part to let him like shoot him working. He was like, I don't want people, I don't, I, there has to be a certain mystery here. You know, I don't want to do that. And I say, well, I gotta tell you, Ralph, the fact that you're almost 80 years old and you still go to the office every day and you're still doing what you've been doing for 50 years is really impressive. I want to show that because I'm impressed by it. Other people were going to, it's going to be interesting to people. And he finally did it, but it was hard. You know, he's <laughs> not somebody who shows, who shows it. He is the health, the face of Ralph Lauren. Do you know well, what I'm saying? Yeah, but in those kind of cases, you know, because, um, you know, this film and the two previous films that you did, you're getting into these very personal um, realms with these people who, you know, maybe we don't always see those sides of them. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the Spielberg uh, documentary. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you facilitate that relationship? Is there, a, is there a, a trick to it or is it just the result of spending time with the people? Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think some people are better at it than others. I think I'm just good at it. I put people at ease. Uh, they know I'm not out to get them. That's a really important part. I'm not out to get anybody. I am out to help the world see their work, understand how their life and their work connect and, and appreciate it more or not appreciate it more, but understand it better. That's my goal. My goal is always about the work and how does the life and the person, how do they come together? And, and um, so I think there's a certain comfort level that I'm not you know, out to get somebody, uh, but I also am out for truth. And, um, that's sometimes a, a, a tricky line, you know, to how do you, if there's some, if there's criticism in someone's, and every artist has criticism, there's nobody that doesn't have criticism. Um, I mean, even Hemingway had criticism, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but not everybody kind of, you know, so how you, how to play, how to balance that out and make sure that you have told a balanced story is very important, but at the same time, not to do it in a kind of gotcha way or, and I, and I think that my films and my history of my filmmaking, people know that I'm, that's not what I'm doing. I am genuinely interested in their work. I am genuinely, genuinely interested in their process and where it comes from and what are the themes that are interesting to them? Where do those themes come from? Why do they do them? Why is there a light motif in somebody's work? Um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of a historian too. I mean, I have a bunch of higher degrees and all that stuff. I'm not a, I'm a, I always thought I was going to be an academic before I decided <laughs> to be a filmmaker. So um, I, I, I'm, I just, I really do a lot of research and I think a lot about it and I'm very prepared in my interviews. I know what I need to get. I work really hard at preparing and then I never look at a single note while I'm doing the interview because I don't have to. So it becomes a conversation. And, uh, and I think that's, um, not everyone does that. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what other people do, but <laughs> I know I've been interviewed by people and they have their list of questions and they're not really listening and going where the conversation might take you, it might take you a totally different place than you had expected, but you know what you got to get. So you kind of make sure you come around to making sure you got it. Uh, but I, I think it's because I do, it's very conversational and it's very, com and I'm not scary. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say you're scary, at least not right now. <laughs> um, um, you, you know, you mentioned about how you thought at one point you were going to be an academic. So how did how did filmmaking uh, come into it? Uh, well, it's interesting. I was, uh, gosh, I don't want to give away my age too much, but um, I, when I finished with graduate school, I was living in Rome, 
And my first husband was the head of the American Academy in Rome. And I wrote an article for the American Studies Quarterly. This is a long time ago. <laughs> about television, I mean, really a long time ago. About television, it was in the 70s. About television and the arts and how I thought it could do better. <laughs> I mean, something only a 30-year-old would write with the kind of arrogance of a 30-year-old, you know. <laughs> what did I know? And, uh, but I it was, anyway, my first husband and I were going to move back to New York because he was becoming president of a college called Cooper Union, uh, which is a very well-known school. And the word got out that we were coming back. And I got a phone call from the president of Channel 13, the New York station, saying, I want to meet you. How'd you like to put your money where your mouth is? He'd read this article. This is a true story. Wow. I never thought about being involved in television. So I, I went to have a meeting with him and I got hired. And that was in 1979. And 35 years later, I left th Channel 13 and went to HBO. In the meantime, I created this series. I was an American Studies major and I got all these degrees in it. And so American, American Masters came right out of my my academic background. So there is a connection there. American masters and a gazillion Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> and something that I think a lot of us, I mean, I'm a teacher and you know, I can't tell you how many times uh, American masters has been like source material for my students. No, well, um, I'm happy to hear that. I, I made it for that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I really, my whole idea of American Masters was essentially very intellectually based and historically based. I wanted to create a library of American cultural history. This was long before we knew that everything was going to be digital and all that. And I envisioned, you know, shelves of these, like the great books, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and that's really truly what, what guided it. And it guided my choices too. Uh, Cause some of them were not always, you know, household names. Uh, I, I always made sure there was a really good balance between names that everybody heard of and names that they should know because they were really important in terms of the, the basic cultural framework of America. And, um, and I wanted the films to be really in-depth films. And uh, I didn't want drive-bys, you know, I didn't want the Reader's Digest version of somebody's story. I really from the very beginning understood that they should be as complex as the people you were making the films about. And uh, that's what I set out to do. And I'm really proud of that. When I left, there were about 250 films in that library. And it's gone on it's since still, I left. And it's, and it's still going. Um, uh, Susan, th I think everybody should go to HBO and watch this film because I, I know I knew very little about uh, Ralph Lauren when I sat down to watch it and it just, I think it's really, really stunning and fascinating. It is, um, it is a good looking film. How could it not be? <laughs> but but I, that, was, that was, I knew it had to be beautiful, but it had to be more than just be beautiful. You know? So I'm really hoping that, that, there is a, that people get that there is an underlying idea behind this film, and, uh, which, which is really about the potency of the American dream and how somebody captured that and sold it to the whole world. And I think that's a pretty good story. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, and stay tuned for more interviews throughout the season. Uh, Susan Lacey, uh, great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. Have a good summer. <laughs>